Awareness, the final frontier. These are the explorations of Jonathan Robinson and Brian Tom O'Connor. Their continuing mission, to discover fresh new paths to the mystery within, to seek out new joys and new methods of awakening, to boldly go into the heart of expanded consciousness. This is Awareness Explorers. Welcome, fellow explorers. This is Brian Tom O'Connor, and I am here with my co-host, Jonathan Robinson. And today, the format is a little bit different. A lot of people have been asking us about details about ourselves, and we usually don't talk that much about ourselves on these episodes. We usually have one particular topic that we devote each episode to. And every once in a while, we have a guest explorer on and we interview them. But for the next two episodes, we're going to try something different. First, I'm going to interview Jonathan. And then in the next episode, Jonathan is going to interview me. So we're going to sort of do a little deep dive into our backgrounds and experiences and what brought us to Awareness Explorers in the first place. So Jonathan, how are you doing today? I'm doing good and uh, looking forward to this. Uh, I happen to know a lot about this topic. <laughs> That's a good thing. You're an expert on yourself, so to speak. I'm trying to be. You're right. And of course, by the self, we mean the universal self, don't we? Uh, that too, yeah. That too, yes. However, today we're focusing on the self. That's uh, Jonathan. And actually, one of my first questions, since we both love to talk about awareness as the source of happiness and joy in the background of all of our experience. How did you first come upon awareness as either a philosophy or a technique or something to investigate? Well, you know, I don't think people start with awareness. I think people start with there's more than something that they may have known about or been taught that meets the eye. Right. And that's the entrance. It might be, you know, psychological, it might be drugs, uh, it might be a spontaneous, you know, mystical experience. For me, though, what I remember is, you know, I had a really uh, difficult childhood, a violent family. So I was kind of searching around age 11 or 12. And my uncle was a hypnotist. I remember him hypnotizing my sister who is a very quiet person, and he hypnotized her to become Mick Jagger, <laughs> you know, and she gets in front of the entire family at some, you know, gathering and starts singing, can't get no satisfaction. And that opened up a world to me. It's like, wow, there's a lot that's possible. And maybe I can tap into that because um, right now it doesn't look so good. So that followed by a bunch of drug experiences as a teenager, you know, marijuana, LSD, mushrooms, all those things opened me up to another world. And eventually, by the time I was 15, I was meditating every day. And when I became, when I was 21, I met the teacher who's had the most influence with me. Um, I spent 25 years with a man named Justin Gold. And he was very focused on awareness. So I don't think I could have gotten to him unless I'd taken step one, two, three. And then I met him and, and he certainly gave us tools and a lot of things to point us in the direction of awareness. Well, that's something that's different between uh, you and me in that uh, you spent 25 years with one teacher. And I believe that was a residential uh, period, right? I mean, you actually lived with this teacher? Yeah, I lived with him probably for 15 of those 25 years. Yeah, that's an experience I haven't had because I've uh, studied with many teachers, but not for such an extensive period of time and also not living with them. So can you tell us a little bit more about that or a lot more about that and what that experience was like? Yeah, it's hard to summarize 25 years, but I will give it a shot. Um, okay. You know, and every teacher is going to be different. 
And this teacher was from New York. Uh, he's still alive. And he's very focused on honesty and feedback. And that was very fortunate for me because I kind of have a little bit of a arrogant personality. And here was somebody who was willing to tell me like it is. And it was very humbling and very difficult a lot of the time because especially when I started writing books and they became bestsellers, you know, everybody kind of looks at you like you're really something. And that's like the death knell to spiritual growth. Whereas, you know, he would always give me an honest reflection of what I was like and what my issues were. And that ended up being very, very important for not settling for, you know, just being an okay person who, who's done well with their career. I instead saw that I was a mess and he was very good at showing you that you were a mess. And his thought was that, you know, awareness and peace is our natural state, but there's levels and levels and parts of us that obscure all that. And his job was to show us those parts because only when you're aware of them could they get smaller or not be so influential in your day-to-day -day life. So it was a path that was in, in some ways rather difficult and humbling for sure, but I think suited to my personality. And I feel very lucky, you know, there were, as with all teachers and all groups, there were things that I didn't like about it for sure. But I do believe that he was, is a real master and it worked for me until it was no longer working for me. And he actually suggested that I move on. Oh, he did? He, uh, he suggested that? Yeah. How did that come about? Well, in his brutally honest way, he said, I think you don't belong here anymore. You're, you know, wanting to do things in the world. And having one foot here and one foot in the world doesn't seem to be useful at this point. And I recommend you go on. I think it was a very selfless thing for him to say because I was the main recruiter, you know, and when I left the group, he no longer had the main recruiter, you know, because some people knew me through the books and such. So I, I think the fact that he saw what was needed for my further development and was willing to say that was a very kind thing for him to do. And uh, prior to that, what were the techniques that he used to um, bring about your connection to awareness and your opening up? Well, I can't give the specific techniques. I can tell you what they were trying to do, you know, because he, he would say that these techniques require, you know, a teacher to supervise. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but one of the techniques was about how we are made up of a lot of different parts. And for people who are familiar with the Gurdjieff work, they know that you know, we have all these different parts of us and some of them, you could call them our shadow side and we tend to hide them and yet they motivate our actions. We want to look good. We want to be right. We want to, uh, we're in a hurry. We're ambitious. We're wanting to be deceitful to get what we want. All these different parts of us. And if you don't know about them, or if you're not aware of them, they suddenly take over your life. And so he had a big emphasis on using tools that helped us to see those parts and to admit to them as they were happening. You know, so one of the tools more or less was kind of anybody in the group could say, what's motivating you now? And you would have to say, well, I'm, um, you know, BSing you because I want you to think I'm a highly spiritual person and look good. That's why I'm, I'm cleaning the living room, so to speak, you know, or whatever it is. And it was very humbling because, you know, when I took drugs and when I would meditate, I would think, well, I'm this lofty person or, 
you know, getting on Oprah or the other TV shows, you know, people started to look at me a certain way, but I knew the reality was all these parts are obscuring my true nature. And my job was to see what is rather than my fantasy. Mm. And how would you describe that true nature? Well, there's a lot of ways to describe it. Um, certainly peace and timelessness and letting distance from these parts or personality. I think of it as, you know, on the surface, it just feels like a little bit of peace. But as you go a little bit deeper, it feels like almost that the thing that we call Jonathan's parts or personality doesn't seem at all like me. And as I go deeper into it, it feels like everything is made up of the same energy and we're all one. And that there's some force giving us life and our concepts of time and ego and all that is just completely made up. And so it's, it's almost like turning the channel from channel two, channel two to channel one. <laughs> you know, on mm -hmm. channel two is there's all this dance of shadow going on and channel one, it's all one energy dancing, playing, and there's this feeling of love and peace that's there. And, you know, I would have moments, but it's a, it's a long road. You know, a lot of times people think they get a glimpse and they're there, but the honesty of this teacher in this system was that, gee, 98% of the time, I'm caught up in identification and 2% is better than nothing, but uh, there's a lot more freedom to be had. Yeah, that is a lovely description and uh, inspiring. Now, you mentioned earlier that your uncle was a hypnotist and hypnotism was part of your life as an adult. As a matter of fact, on your resume, I think you were head of UC Santa Barbara Hypnosis Lab. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Was that before or after this period uh, with Justin Gold? Before. It was really the predecessor. You know, I think a lot of people first have to realize that there's something going on. You know, you get interested in miracles or the power of the mind or, you know, the uh, what's the secret based on the, the power of attraction. And you, and you start to see that, wow, there's, there's a lot of channels out there that I can tune into. And I think a lot of it really has to do with ego and power. You know, um, people like to know that there's abilities of the mind that most people don't have. I know I went through that. Gee, I'm, I want to impress women by the fact that I can see auras or that uh, I could hypnotize them and, or whatever it was. And I think, you know, it's hard to skip that that phase. Hmm. But after a while, it got like, okay, been there, done, done that, got the t-shirt. And maybe I want to actually be free. And maybe be a service of this higher force. So that became compelling to me. Not the other stuff isn't compelling to me. I still like, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, li I like to feel powerful. But um, really, there's nothing more powerful than dissolving into service of the force that keeps us alive. And that's, but unfortunately, to do that, you have to die. And I don't mean physically die. I mean, the ego has to surrender. And uh, it's almost like your first step is gaining power. And, and Justin used to say this, the first step of spiritual growth is, is gaining power and gaining an ego that is strong and capable. The second step is giving it all up. You can't, you know, go from child to surrender, you know, where you don't have an ego, where you don't have any inner strength. You can't spiritual bypass that way. And, uh, which is too bad. <laughs> but, you know, um, so I did 
grow a strong ego and strong abilities in the world. And then, you know, step two, okay, now give it all up and uh, surrender to this force that keeps you alive in the moment. And um, that's a hard turnaround. Do you think that developing a strong ego in the world is an obstacle or a hindrance to that surrender? I think it's both a necessary part of it and it's a hindrance. Mm -hmm. I suppose having a weak ego or being somehow um, uh, feeling bad about yourself is actually a flip side of the same coin and that could be just as much of a hindrance since it's a concentration on you, the personality, as opposed to you, the greater awareness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody has their unique brand of obstacles. Right. And your mission, should you decide to accept it, is to see those clearly, to accept them, to not run away from them, not deny them, not distract from them. And there's not many people doing that work nowadays. You know, it's all about, in the, in the spiritual marketplace, it's largely about transcendence, you know, because that feels good. But I think I was very grateful to Justin because he was all about the work. You know, the reason he never charged any money and he is a master, but he didn't have many students because anytime you talk to him, it was about, you know, here, here's the parts that you don't want to see. And uh, I, I found that to be really advantageous that I got into that system. Now I'm more about transcendence. But luckily, I have that foundation where I don't lie to myself as much as I used to or distract myself. And, and so I feel really lucky that I got the first floor pretty well built before I went for transcendence a lot. Right. Now, you've also um, interviewed many teachers and studied with many teachers and spiritual masters over the years. Uh, is there anyone that, uh, that particularly, other than Justin, that stands out uh, for you or that you have uh, interesting stories about? Well, a lot of them I have interesting stories about. I, I met everybody from Muktananda, Mother Teresa, Dalai Lama, Sai Baba, Poonjaji, uh, wow. Byron Katie, uh, Ram Dass. You know, one of the things Justin taught me is if there's something you're interested in, be persistent and go for it. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I ever told this story, but uh, for one of my books where I was interviewing all these teachers, I, I was trying to get Deepak Chopra and uh, he just wouldn't do the interview or he wouldn't respond to me. And finally he calls me and says, I don't do these interviews anymore because I get so many requests, but uh, I've never seen anybody as persistent as you. I'll, I'll do his voice. I, and he said, uh, According to my records, you've called 50 times. You've sent uh, 43 letters. You have three of my friends calling me to tell me to do the interview. The reason I'm calling is I want to know if you're on a mission from God or a complete lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> and I what told did him, you tell? I told him I'm on a mission from God. And he said, I'll give you 10 minutes right now. Oh, how great. But, you know, um, in terms of people who affected me, I'd say the person who has affected me most than Justin is a guy named Jeffrey Martin, who you know, mm -hmm. who teaches a course called the Finders Course, which is kind of the greatest hits of spiritual awareness methods. And it's an expensive course, but it's a great course. And, and that really had impact. And then there was this guy named Brian Telmar Connor who wrote this great book called Awareness Games. <laughs> Have you heard of him? <laughs> I think... Yeah, somewhere in the back of my mind, I think I met this guy. Yeah, yeah. You met him once or twice. Well, he writes brilliantly. And, uh, and he had a lot of really simple techniques that I like. I'm very technique oriented. And so uh, techniques where you're really focusing on awareness, I have found very useful in the last few years. Well, that's lovely to hear and lovely for you to say. And just for our listeners, uh, when I asked that question, I certainly wasn't fishing for an answer like that. I thought you might actually tell some Sai Baba stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sai Baba was very powerful. But, you know, rather than think that a teacher is going to do it for you, because Sai Baba, I had outlandish experiences around Sai Baba. I mean, I'll, I'll tell one of them. 
I have mixed feelings about him and he's a controversial guru, but uh, I do magic uh, amateurishly, you know, and, and I um, was a psychic studies major at UCLA. So I'm interested in ESP and things like that. And so I wanted to see if this guy could really manifest ash from his hand the way they say he could. Mm -hmm. So the first day I'm at his ashram, you know, he manifests some ash for people maybe 30 feet away. And I'm, I know how a magician could do that, but he, I couldn't tell from 30 feet. So he comes right up to me and he puts his hand like basically right next to my face and he starts manifesting ash. And I'm not talking about a little bit of ash, you know, like a, a, a cigarette. I'm talking about maybe a half gallon. I'm inundated with ash, like buried in it, you know. And I look to see if he has any false thumb or sleeve thing going on, and I couldn't see any of that. And then he looks at me, and he's after he's done this for a while, and he says, "Satisfied, magic man." <laughs> Wow, did that blow your mind? Uh, no, but the next thing he did blew my mind. He, he leaned over to whisper. I thought he was going to whisper something in my ear. And instead, he sneezed on me. And when he sneezed on me, it was kind of like being hit by a, a wave of love or something that was so powerful that I remember my last thought was, let go, you're about to die. And I, I came to about six hours later. You know, and experiences like that are great. And I love the miracle and the magic part, or at least at one part of my life, I was very focused on that. Um, you know, after a while, it's like I stopped chasing that stuff and said, you know, it really comes down to kind of like what Ajahn Shanti said, which was, how would awareness walk to your car? Hmm. How would awareness iron your clothes? You know, and, and it's a discovery in the little moments. You know, Justin used to have a term called fake fuchsia. Everybody's looking for fake fuchsia. You know, that really intense color. They said, life is very much pale pink. You know, but there's some pink in it. There's some mystery. There's some magic in every moment. And your job is to not go chasing the fuchsia all the time you know, the miracles, uh, the sex, drugs, rock and roll, but to see the miracle in the, in the subtle pink of everyday life. And that was a really good lesson for me because I was pretty focused on, on miracles and psychic phenomena and fake fuchsia. Wow, I love that metaphor. It is such a wonderful visual image. And, uh, and I think, yes, I think that's very profound and something that we do need to learn because it's so easy to get distracted by uh, the bright lights yeah, and shiny yeah. objects. Now, yeah. you've been working, or I believe you are about to put out a, um, a recording about uh, near-death experiences. Is that right? And you actually had one a while ago. I was yeah. wondering if you would be interested in talking about that or describing that. Yeah, it had a, a major effect on me. Um, when I was about 28, I was in New Zealand. And I was taking one of those shuttle vans back to um, the airport as a passenger. And we were going pretty fast. And at about 80 miles an hour, we hit a patch of ice. And I remember thinking this guy's going pretty fast for where we are because there's cliffs on both sides of the road. And as when we hit the patch of ice, we ended up going down the road sideways, headed for the cliff. So I had about five seconds to realize that I'm about to go off a cliff and will probably die. And during those five seconds, time just slowed down and I got to review my life. And the review looked like I was looking at it through two filters. One filter was what have you learned about love? So little acts of kindness I did stood out. Little times that I was not kind stood out. The other filter was, did you complete what you came here to do? And I realized I hadn't. 
you know, I was kind of playing small. So that felt regretful. Then boom, we go over the cliff. The cliff was only about 40 feet high, luckily. And someone in that van did die and somebody else became quadriplegic. What happened to me, something hit my back so hard it broke my back and stopped my heart. And the good news was that there happened to be a fire truck right behind our van that saw all this and they were down in the, in the um, ravine, you know, within three minutes. They saw I wasn't breathing. They started my heart. I had one of those experiences, which you hear about, where you see the light and, you know, this loving presence. And, you know, if I had any doubt that there's something going on, that pretty much cleared that up. I was told I was going to go back. I wake up in a hospital, you know, later. And it made it clear to me that I really had something I was supposed to do here uh, that had to do with getting methods out to a larger audience. And since then, I've reached like 200 million people with that, you know, on mostly TV. And I think that there's some help in that. Like there's, I, I take it that, you know, maybe I have... Uh, good books or something, but it really requires some force helping you. And I even feel that with the writing of my books, that some force is helping me. And my job is to listen and try to do what I feel that way. And, and one of the things that started to happen is I started to create these near-death meditation experiences for audiences I was speaking to. Corporate-wise, I kind of came up with a 20-minute version that gave people a similar experience without having to leave the safety of their, their seat. You know, it took me a few years to come up with the right ingredients, but it became something I was very known for in the corporate world. And, you know, they need that. And it's kind of like you go through a death and rebirth, and it's very powerful. I would, I would go to a place like Google, and everybody would be, you know, crying and having these intense experiences. And um, that felt really satisfying to, to have a way to give people that experience that puts things in perspective, that gets you clear on what's important to you. And, and that we all are here for a very short period of time. You know, life, that boom, in the history of humanity, it's basically like that. And, and we need helpers nowadays because it's so easy to get caught up in all the BS of daily life. So, uh, well, recently I actually created this product. I'd never created it, but people were asking me and um, I created it with iAwake Technologies and it has brainwave entrainment and, and it actually kind of, people are saying that they're actually having near-death experiences with this thing. Uh, I'm really pleased with how it turned out and we just went on sale a couple weeks ago and evidently it's doing really well it's called the near-death meditation experience and i think people can find out about it at uh, neardeathmeditation.com wow that is so fascinating it is i i feel really good about it uh because you know, not only giving it to other people so that they can have that safe experience, but, you know, they've done studies and they show that if you really want to transform somebody's life, the single best way by far is for people to have a near-death experience. It literally transforms people's lives. The problem with it is that, you know, unfortunately you have to die, you know, historically, and then come back, you know, through CPR or whatever. Uh, so it's not a, a easy experience for a lot of people to have. And I think this meditation helps people to get a pretty good taste of that experience without the trauma. Mm. Now, I believe that uh, for the guided meditation for this episode, you have one that's based on that. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's a lot more mellow. <laughs> it has none of the sound effects or anything. And it's only like 10 minutes instead of 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. 
But um, it, I think it's still useful because I think that we are so hiding from death in this culture and hiding from the magic of birth and that we have limited time, that that sense of urgency can help people to have an experience of um, knowing what's really important. And, you know, I'm, I'm uh, 59 now, so I feel my mortality a lot more than I did when I was, you know, 30. Mm -hmm. And whether you're 30 or 90, you don't got long. And that sense of urgency helps me to focus on now and awareness and doing what I'm supposed to be doing rather than all the other stuff, which is so easy to get lost in. Yes, well, that's wonderful to hear about. And uh, I think so important for people to, to really ponder uh, because uh, our lives get caught up in things that aren't important when we just are only involved in our day-to-day -day struggles. And it puts it into such a, a deeper and larger context. Yeah, the whole culture is based on selling you stuff for distraction, pretty much. You know, people ask, would you like fries with that? Or they don't say, are you living your true mission? You know, nobody asks you that. Or nobody asks, uh, well, what have you done today to develop yourself spiritually? And, and that's one of the reasons we started this podcast is we wanted the reminders, but give people easy ways even freeways to make what's important part of your drive to work or whatever. Well said. Well, before we get into the uh, guided meditation, is there anything we left out or anything you'd like to bring up or tell our listeners about? I will give one. It's not a tool from my old teacher, but it was a, an idea that really shaped my life. And he said, um, try to have an experimental attitude. That an experimental attitude means try things and see what, they, what effect they have on you. And not that you're going to commit to this teacher or that teaching, but try it, see what it does. If it doesn't work, try something else. And I've been able to use that to try things I never would have otherwise done. You know, because it would have been too scary. Like, Try a retreat for a week as an experiment. Try this drug as an experiment. Try doing a, a few of these podcasts as an experiment. See how it works out. And that has really helped me to move forward in a lot of different dimensions. Whereas if I said, okay, uh, do I want to commit to this forever? I would have never done those steps. So having this experimental attitude has really been a blessing. And the other thing is, I think that change can happen very, very quickly. Uh, a story I tell is that when I was 18, I was still very shy and afraid of rejection. And I realized that whether it be dating women or meeting spiritual teachers or doing anything, I was going to have to face rejection. So I made a deal with a friend to get rejected by 10 women in one day. And if I did that, we'd go to Hawaii together. <laughs> and now this fear of rejection had just totally been influencing my life to that day. And, you know, the first time I went up to a woman, I'm facing, you know, the goal, I just changed the goal. I'm going to get rejected 10 times. So, the first woman I come up to, um, I'm literally drenched with sweat. I'm shaking. And I say, hello. And she turns around. She sees this guy drenched in sweat and shaking. And she says, are you all right? Do you need an ambulance? She thought I was having a seizure. And I said, no, no. You know, and I, I asked her out. And she said, well, I have a boyfriend and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I got one rejection, and it got so much easier with each person I did that within like 10 minutes, I had approached the seventh woman, and now I'm relaxed. I know what the script is going to be, and I say, hey, I'm new here. I'd like to 
uh, go out with you sometime? And she says, sure. And never occurred to me somebody might say yes. So I said, sure what? And she said, yeah, I'd like to go out with you. I go, really? I write down her number. Anyway, long story short, I get the final rejection. I, I had eight women said yes that day. Wow. But I got the 10th the rejection, which was hard to get, actually. And um, it changed my life in literally half an hour. Because now I reduce my fear of rejection from like a 10 to a 2 or a 3. And that opened up new friends, new dates, new career possibilities. So I think certain transformations can happen really quickly if you have the right technique. And that has always stayed with me, that my job is to figure out where I am now and come up with the method that will get me to the next step as quickly as possible. So uh, yeah, my life changed literally in half an hour when I, when I did that initial experiment. Well, what a great story. I, thanks for sharing that with us. It's <laughs> very entertaining and enlightening. <laughs> good, good. So would this be a good time to um, share Absolutely. the guided meditation? I'd love to. Great. And I, I should tell people that even though this is, you know, has no sound effects and is a shortened version of the near-death meditation, um, it can still be a little bit intense. So uh, prepare yourself for that and uh, make yourself comfortable. Uh, this would be a type of thing where you'd want to close your eyes if you possibly can. And take a couple of deep breaths. And imagine you can breathe into the center of your chest and feel the warmth there. Just let go of any thoughts about the past or future. While we tend to think the time of our passing from this world is a ways off, in fact, death can happen at any time. You could even die today of a heart attack or a stroke, a car accident, a brain aneurysm. We never know when our time is up. So in preparation for the day that your time here is really up, I want you to imagine as best you can that today is the day you're leaving planet Earth. In fact, I want you to imagine that you have five minutes left. Five minutes to say some final goodbyes and to let go of your past. If you knew you were going to die in five minutes, what would you want to do during those last few minutes? For the next four and a half minutes, I want to guide you in a letting go process that will prepare you. And you can begin by saying some goodbyes. And let's begin by saying goodbye with gratitude to some of the beautiful places you have known. As I speak, think of or picture favorite places you visited during your time on earth. And as they come to mind, from your heart, say goodbye and thank you for the chance to know these wonders. What other places have you been to? Say goodbye and thank you for each place you've been graced to know. Feel your thanks for having known such beauty. And now with three and a half minutes left, I want you to think of a specific person or beloved pet or child that you have loved. The first one that comes to mind is fine. Feel your connection you have with them in your heart.
Think about what you love about them and remember special times you felt connected to them. Now imagine saying your goodbye to this person or pet. What would you like to convey to them as your final message before you pass from this world? Take some time now and think that inside your head. What else do you need to convey to them? You have about two minutes left. Perhaps this being you've loved has a message they'd like to convey to you before you leave this world. Take a minute to listen for any sense of what they would want to convey to you. What else would they want to convey to you? You have 40 seconds left. Allow yourself to say goodbye to your body, how it has served you all these years, your arms, your legs. Saying goodbye with gratitude for the chance and grace of a human birth. How do you want to leave this world? Prepare yourself by getting centered in your heart and giving thanks for having known the blessing and gift of a human life. 10 seconds left. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Let go of everything and take a deep breath and let go into a formless void, completely surrendering to watchful awareness. Imagine now you're moving through what seems like a tunnel with a light at the end of this tunnel. This light feels like a warm, joyous sunshine and you feel that it is radiating both love and wisdom as you slowly move towards it. As you feel the warmth of this light, you feel like it's asking you a question. And the question it's asking is, if you were to return to earth, what would you have left to do that you still need to complete? Or more simply, what do you still need to do? Take a minute and listen for any intuitive thought or feeling that feels right to you. What else do you need to do if given more time on earth? Whatever answer you got, evidently it was a good one since the being of light is sending you back to earth so you have more time. You're being given another chance to complete all the things you never fully completed. You'll be given another chance to reunite with loved ones and the gift of human life. So imagine that you're moving backwards through this tunnel, back to being fully present in your human form. Picture people and pets you have loved and imagine them welcoming you back in a celebration of love and gratitude.
And as you think about the limited time you have to enjoy and make use of a human body, think of how you want to live your remaining time on earth. Let images of what you'd like to create float through your mind. Where would you like to go? Who would you like to spend time with? What would you like to accomplish? Now let all of that go and come back to feeling your body in the chair. Come back to feeling the warmth of your heart in your chest. Feel the gratitude for being able to take in a deep breath. Feel your gratitude for being given more time on earth to play, dance, love, and create. And when you're ready, start slowly opening your eyes to a magical world of time, space, and mystery. Take as much time as you need. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That was a beautiful and emotional experience. Yeah, yeah. Very profound and uh, beautifully done. I'm so grateful. Well, the, uh, the actual product, the near-death meditation experience, is about 10 times more intense. And, and uh, I hope people check it out, because I think that sense that we have limited time and to get clear is more important now than ever before. Yes. So uh, I'm not, I don't like selling stuff, but I really believe that people can benefit from this. And I think they can find out more about it, neardeathmeditation.com. And, uh, and also ask questions at Awareness Explorers. And, you know, feel free to email Brian or I. And we like engaging with our listeners because uh, we also need all the help we can get in remembering what's important. That's right. Well, this has been very fun and illuminating and i enjoyed it so much i hope that it gives our listeners a taste of why i enjoy talking to you so much and why we do this podcast which actually started out as just a simple weekly conversation that you and i would have on uh on skype and yeah. we decided to turn it into it was your wonderful idea to just turn it into a podcast and and we did it and I have so much fun talking to you, and I hope that uh, our listeners get a flavor of that. So thank you so much, Jonathan. Well, I've been blessed by a lot of really wonderful teachers, and it feels good to pass it on. Thank you. And just a, a little note to our listeners is that these podcasts are free, and they're available on all sorts of channels on YouTube and iTunes and Google Play and iHeartRadio and, and lots of them. But it does cost time and money to make them. And uh, so if you happen to feel so inspired, there's a donate button on our website, awarenessexplorers.com. And of course, please continue to listen for free Uh, without any feeling of obligation. But if you just happen to feel like uh, supporting this free podcast, think about maybe giving a donation on our website. And uh, so on behalf of Jonathan and myself, I want to thank you all for listening and joining us on Awareness Explorers. And um, as we say at the end of every episode, keep exploring. Keep exploring. 
Thank you for listening to Awareness Explorers. To learn more, you can check out our website at awarenessexplorers.com. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite podcast app. And we'd love it if you would post a review. And please share our link on Facebook and with family and friends. Because knowing yourself as awareness is the greatest gift you can give yourself or someone you love.